Now, I want to introduce a person whom I had lunch with when he was new. I, I've been around longer than he has. Hmm, I like that. But I have seen Dan Snowberger come in and provide clear, decisive, personalized leadership in the district at a critical juncture. We need change. We need capable people. And uh, I just am so pleased to see Dan in the area and his staff. So let me, with great pleasure and no further ado, welcome and introduce my friend, Dan Snowberger. Good morning, and I know a lot of you have been wondering for the last month, what is this all about, and what more are they going to add to our plate? Um, so let me get the elephant in the room right now. The intent of today is not to add to your plate, but hopefully help us work smarter and not harder. Um, in education, we do a lot of that. We add a lot of things to our plates, and we never take anything off. And so I'm hoping today, as you go through this training, that you're going to see some things that really outline what it is that we should be doing um, in 9R, in public education across the nation, to make sure that our kids are getting the maximum benefit and the greatest achievement and outcomes possible. Now, some people will say, you know, this new superintendent guy brought all of this stuff, and what's he thinking, and, um, you know, maybe Durango isn't where he should be. Let me hopefully, in this a few minutes of my remarks before beginning the actual training, outline why. Because it isn't about me, it's not about what I thought. It's about some legislation that's been in the works for years, 2007 on, that we are having to comply with. And unfortunately, it appears as if we haven't talked a lot about that in Durango 9R. So I want to outline for you a couple of things. But first, let me tell you about an experience I had last week. I had the opportunity of spending a week um, with other districts across the nation who are involved in the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation MET project. And Bill and Melinda Gates have funded some extreme research in education and how to make sure that we're supporting teachers, how are we supporting teachers and their growth and their practice, how are we supporting kids and their learning to increase outcomes? Um, and Melinda unveiled a video last week, and so I'm going to take a moment and just share it, because I think it sets the tone for really what we're about today. So let's take a moment and watch this. This is just a room with tables, chairs, books, and laptops. All the pieces are there, but alone they don't mean anything. The only thing that makes this room a classroom is you, a teacher. You're the one who greets us in the morning. You're there every day to answer our questions and challenge us with new ones. You care, you inspire, you believe in us until we believe in ourselves. You help us see that math is beautiful and words are powerful. You teach us not to memorize, but to learn. And show us success comes from hard work, practice, and determination. You're dedicated to our dreams before we even know how much they matter to us. You are key to student success in our schools, but shouldn't have to do it alone. With new tools for delivering more personalized instruction, real-time data on student achievement, and consistent academic standards expanding to 46 states, teachers have an opportunity to shape the profession like never before. But the stakes are high. Teachers are under a lot of pressure and need our support starting with better feedback on performance, professional development tailored to each teacher's needs, and time and technology to collaborate with teachers around the country and colleagues next door. Teachers need opportunities to become leaders in our schools because no one knows better than teachers can make our classroom stronger. Without teachers, the classroom is just a room. It comes to life every time a teacher connects with a student. It is a teacher who brings passion, knowledge, and dedication. It is a teacher who makes a difference in our students' success. Harry, I believe very strongly that you in this room are the people who will make 9R the best district in the state, who will make our kids prepared for whatever they choose in the future. Um, and that's hard work. It is the most difficult work of our time. It's the most important work of our time. 
Back at convocation, many of you listened and I got some really positive feedback. Um, but I think many people thought, well, this is just talk. And so I want to just revisit real quickly because hopefully you'll see where we've been very true to the course that we set out back in August. We said we had to do things we never did before so we could accomplish what we never accomplished before. We talked about specific uh, aspects of our mission, and that is that we're preparing kids for jobs that don't exist. We're preparing kids today for jobs that we can only imagine. When we went to school, we knew there were jobs. Many of us went through career education programs. We watched videos about how to be a doctor and how to be a teacher and how to be a police officer. Today, we can't do that because the jobs that our ninth graders who will, will take, the jobs that will be available to them, aren't yet in existence. And that's a huge, overwhelming challenge for us. So we said back then, in August, that schools had to look differently than they did in the 20th century. We still go to school for nine months, we still get out as if our kids have to go pick crops, um, we have a limited school day, um, we have many of the practices that have been in place forever. We also talked about instructional practices that have to engage our kids. We talked briefly about the achievement gap. And we have kids who come to school we know with intrinsic motivation. Parents have high expectations for them. They work hard to pay attention. They work hard to get meaning from what we do. And then we have kids who don't come with that set of expectations. And so engaging them is different than just teaching. Engaging them is using practices that get them at the edge of their seat, whether they have someone at home setting high expectations for them or not. And we talked about changing the way we assess. We talked about the fact that the ABCD answer was no longer how we could truly assess whether our kids were learning what we expected them to do. And so those were all things we talked about back in August, and hopefully you can connect those to some of the work that we're doing. We also said that 9R had achievement gaps. And at the time, I said that our achievement gaps weren't much different than across the state or the nation. Unfortunately, we have to take that back. Because since August, we've been notified by CE that we have some of the largest achievement gaps with regard to students who are minority, students who are on free and reduced lunch, and students who are special education identified. So we have challenges that we have to deal with. We have to face the brutal facts. We have some kids. Are we doing great work? We are doing great work. And I know that some people feel that I've talked only about the things we should do differently. We do great things for our kids. I have three kids in our system that are greatly benefiting from coming to school each and every day. But we do have kids in our system that aren't. And those are who we need to deal with. Those are who we need to adjust our practice to make sure that not only our kids who come intrinsically motivated, but our kids who come who don't have that same motivation are making the same gains as those who don't. We talked back in August about our TCAP achievement gap and our ACT achievement gap not being very different. We have boys and girls underperforming, boys underperforming girls. We have Hispanic students underperforming their non-Hispanic peers. Those are all issues we have to address, and I believe very strongly that if you are here and open today to hearing about some new practice and some new strategies, then we will address that gap. We will change the future for that portion of our population. We talked in August about overcoming the execution gap, and we talked about having clearly defined curriculum. And yes, we pulled back on some of our dashboards because as we looked at our dashboards, we realized we kind of picked what we thought was important and missed a lot of things that were important. And so we said, let's pull back from our dashboards. Let's make sure we're looking at the state standards document and that we develop pacing guides that clearly support you in knowing how do I go through this curriculum and address the needs of all students during the year and make sure that we get to mastery for all students. We also talked about effective formative assessments and since then we've begun that initiative. There's 55 of you in this room that are a part of that, that are helping us write quality assessment tasks, not A, B, C, D items, but tasks that cause students to perform, to demonstrate that they know and they can do what they need to as a result of their learning. 
We also talked about early and frequent interventions, and we talked about early childhood programs. And at that time, I talked about Libby Culver and her role. Um, next year, we will have more preschool options available. We will be looking at our kindergartners who aren't ready for school and determining are there other options that we need to pursue to make sure that we prepare them for success. A kindergartner who starts behind, unless we do something different, will remain behind. And our high school teachers will continue to get kids who are three and four and five grade levels below in reading, having to have that challenge of covering not only content knowledge, but also readdressing those, those learning gaps. We talked about that personal connection. Remember, we said parents send us the best that they have. Our parents don't wake up in the morning and send us kids that, well, I'm going to keep my best, but I'll send you my not-so-good student. Our kids that come to school are the very best that our parents have, but we have to build connections with them. We have to find what makes them tick. We have to deal with that relationship issue. We also talked about finding ways in our system to have students demonstrate success in a variety of ways. You're going to hear as we talk more about Common Core, how critical that is, that just taking my test and passing my test may not be the only way that kids can demonstrate mastery. And then back in August, we talked about reforming our grading system. We talked about the fact that we can't have grades that reflect things other than mastery of content. And how does that work, and what do we have to do about that? And so, again, as we look at these things, hopefully you can now connect them back to yeah, that's why we're doing that. That's what we said in August, and that's what we're doing. What I hope to build as I continue my tenure here in, in Durango is, I say what I mean, and I mean what I say. And so I ask you to hold me accountable for that, because that's what it's all about. It's about making sure we have a vision, that we're all working together to achieve that vision. So it does take teamwork. I can't do this by myself. My core team can't do this by ourselves. Our principals can't do this by themselves. It takes all of us working together to achieve this work. We talked about feedback, and I'm going to put the elephant in the room. We worked during the first half of the year in trying to provide quality feedback. We've had principals visiting classrooms more than they ever have in the past. We've had them using an instructional feedback form that's missed the mark in many ways. But we've begun that process because we know how critical it is that you get feedback. And feedback isn't negative. Feedback isn't, you need to do this better or you need to do that instead. It's around, how can I improve my practice? What are you seeing as an as a outside party observing my work that maybe I'm not seeing? That's what feedback is about. I've received my feedback. Almost 280 of you participated in a survey in December, and your feedback was extremely helpful to me in really looking at how can I do a better job as your superintendent. I take that to heart, and hopefully you'll see what I'm doing differently as a result of the feedback that you've given me. We talked about those research studies. Um, uh, Mike Schmoker, a uh, Coloradoan who did research around, if we're going to improve outcomes, we have to improve instruction. We talked about the research study, um, how the best performing schools make it to the top, um, and their result was improved instruction. So everything we've said, um, we've been trying to do. Not always perfectly, and we still have work to do. So change, why are we changing? When we talk about change, I know change is something that we're uncomfortable with. We're human beings. Human beings are, are, are would much prefer consistency and clear set direction. But we have to change. And I want to just point out some of that legislation that I mentioned that's critical so that you um, really can think about why. Why are we doing this? Again, we've talked about the achievement gap. Remember the 90-90-90 schools research I mentioned at Convocation. There are schools who are doing it. There are schools who have 90% minority students, 90% uh, students who are free and reduced lunch or more, and 90% proficiency. So it can be done. It's not a myth. It's not a, a dream. It's a reality if we apply similar practice to our work. We also have to understand that we have new Colorado academic standards. 
we've taken these new standards and we've tried to continue to apply the same practice we did with old standards. And that's what won't work. And that's why we decided we needed to take a day and really talk about those standards and help you have a, hopefully a deeper understanding of what those standards are and what they mean to you as a classroom teacher. We also have um, in our standards a National Common Core. When we've talked about National Common Core, many teachers have said, oh great, our standards are going to change again. No, they aren't. The Common Core is embedded in Colorado academic standards. So the standards that we've been talking about, the standards that we worked with with our dashboards, the standards that hopefully many of you brought with you today, are the standards that we expect to be in place for a long time. Um, and those are based on the National Common Core. 46 states across the nation have adopted those National Common Core. So what kids in Colorado learn should be very similar to what kids in Kansas learn, what kids in Kentucky learn, what kids in New York learn. We now have a common set of standards. The other issue is CSAT. We're used to CSAT. Many districts focus on CSAT. They focused on the old standards because the test our kids will take in a matter of weeks now is still based on the old standards. But TCAP is going away. TCAP has one more year after this, and then it's gone. Good news, bad news. Bad news is, or good news in my opinion is, we have a new assessment, it's called PARC. PARC is a consortium of 20 some, I'm not sure the exact number, I'm just escaping, 20 some schools, or 20 some states across the nation who have adopted and chosen to go with PARC. PARC is a national assessment that we will administer in reading, writing, and math, grades three through 11. Hear that, 11. <coughs> and then the state will begin testing next year science and social studies. And there is talk that social studies will happen at the fall of 12th grade. So the days of we get this state stuff out of the way at 10th grade and now we just kind of focus on ACT, those are gone. The tests are very different, and you'll hear from our presenters today about how different they are. They aren't about what you memorize. They're about what you can demonstrate within performance tasks. And that's huge to recognize. It's not only about what kids can remember. It's about how they can apply their knowledge. And then here's the exciting news for me. PARC will inform college placement. So in the, in the past, CSAP has been something you do until 10th grade and then you kind of forget it. It didn't impact your life. PARC impacts your life in college. PARC will be used by colleges to determine placement, whether you're ready for college credit or whether you need remediation, whether you need to take alternate courses to prepare yourself for the rigors of college. PARC will be a tool used by universities across the nation to determine readiness for college. That's a huge change in what we do. But here's a real challenge. Many colleges have lost funding for remediation. And so our colleges now are looking, is that student truly ready for college? Are they ready to face the rigors of college? And unfortunately, less than 50% of our kids were last year. Less than 50% of our graduating class met the criteria to go right into a college level English math class. So we have some work to do, and that's what's critical that we recognize. This is the biggest elephant in the room, Senate Bill 10 191. And we've been working on it. We're an integration district, we're a pilot district. Five of you from every building are working with your principals on this new teacher evaluation tool that will likely become our teacher evaluation tool next year. I say likely because we have negotiations and we need to talk about it. We need to make sure that it gets better because we know the one that we have today isn't perfect. It needs some work. And so the feedback we're giving hopefully will inform a better tool that we can then adopt as a district. Our 1338 committee is working on this and we'll continue to look at it, keep you apprised of it. But what is critical about 191 is 50% of your evaluation will need to be um, student achievement, 50% will need to be performance. So that, that's, that's real. 
that's live, that's coming. Its implementation is 1314. And when it passed in 2010, that seemed ages away. But it's here. It's here now for next year. And so when we talk about um, some of the things that we're doing, again, there are changes coming not because we chose it, not because I chose it, the board chose it, our core team chose it, our principals chose it. Change is coming because there's a nation nationwide effort to make sure we improve the delivery and the quality of outcomes of our for our kids, that we improve education across the country. And so we're part of that initiative. It's an exciting time to be an educator. It's also a scary time to be an educator because we're very used to the way things have been. But it will be okay. And our kids will benefit. And we will find a way to make our practice much less stressful uh, than it is today. I believe that very sincerely. So here's the three focuses we'll have as we move forward as, as a school district. One is we will continue to work on understanding and implementing the Colorado Academic Standards. That's critical that we continue to do that. We will continue to develop our common formative assessments. And let me tell you folks, if you're not involved and you want to be, we need to know that soon. Because we're about to have to contract out with outside teachers to get this work done. I believe you're the experts. You're the ones who best know how our kids can demonstrate mastery of standards. But we have some content areas that have no teachers who have volunteered. And I know there's so much on your plate. So please know that if you're not volunteering, that doesn't mean I think you're not willing. I think we really have to think about what are we doing, what's important to our practice, and what can we do to support this work. Common formative assessments will not only give you the means to track your student progress on state standards, but also give us another legitimate, valued measure, hopefully, locally, that we can use in that 50% of student achievement for your evaluation. That we have something we have control over, something we have the ability to say, yes, we believe that if students can do this, they've demonstrated mastery. Without that, we, we rely on a state test. And that's something I find completely unacceptable for you because I know the great practice and I know the great work you do each and every day. And a one-day test doesn't mean that you got it or you didn't. And that's why common formative assessments are so critical to me and that we continue that work. And then we're going to work on high-quality instructional feedback. So principals are continue to get training, continue to work together, continue to find ways of improving their coaching skills, continue to find ways of making sure that the feedback they're giving you is quality and helpful and provides you a chance to grow in your practice. That's critical that we continue to work on that. And that means, yes, Victor and I will continue to visit classrooms with them, continue to coach them. The intent is never, never to wear you down or to knock you down. The intent is to provide quality feedback around what's working really well and what might be some strategies you might want to consider. That's the intent of feedback. And so we'll continue to work on our comfort level with that because I know it's something very new for many of you. Many of you never had an administrator in your room except when it was time for your formal observation. Those days are gone. I'd love to talk more about teacher uh, peer evaluation, having peers be able to give you feedback and you give feedback to peers. I think that's how we grow more in our professionalism, as we open our doors to each other to really say, how can you help me be better? How can you help me improve my practice? That's when our system will really make great leaps and bounds in the future. So I just close in saying, again, we have to do what we've never done before. If we're going to accomplish what we've never accomplished before, change is hard. I know some people are on board with change. Some people would rather fight change. Change is here, and I want to work with you to make sure we do what we need to do to support you in really embracing those practices. It's going to take teamwork, and there are a lot of puzzle pieces, and you'll see some of them on your table. Let me just say first, thank you, Gretchen Wilson and DBA, for their strong support. Putting this training together, DEA and CEA have been phenomenal partners. We are partners. We're not antagonists. We're not uh, opposed to each other. We're about working together because together we will make the Rainbow 9R what we all know it can be. 
Um, you're going to have a lot of puzzle pieces put together for you today because of some outstanding trainers that we've been able to secure for you today. And so, yes, it's odd to cancel a day of school, but when we had the opportunity to have Peg Porcello and Linda Barker come to our district and provide some quality uh, professional development to you, there, there was a no-brainer. Today, I believe, will have greater impact on the rest of the year than anything else we could dream of doing. And I believe at the end of the 